I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Did you have a happy New Year's party? Oh, I had a wonderful New Year's party, and the man came all dressed up as Father Time. You say the man came dressed as Father Time? Yes, but he didn't fool me. <laughs> he was my father. <laughs> oh. And have you promised your father and your teacher and yourself that you're going to do everything better this New Year? Yes. I made lots of good New Year's revolutions. Uh Uh-huh. Good revolutions. Oh, that's fine. Yes. Well, I think that's wonderful. And if everybody else does the same and keeps these promises, these revolutions, maybe we'll all be much happier this year. Oh, I hope so. And now, will you please read me the funny? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will, in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy has discovered that the man responsible for smuggling guns to the Indians so they could go on the warpath was Meeker, the head of the freight office in Pike's Landing. When the Indians attacked Pike's Landing, Meeker escaped from the freight office where Hoppy had trailed him. He ran to a river steamer docked at the wharf and has ordered the captain to get under the way. As the steamer pulls off, Hoppy dashes down the street across the wharf and makes a leap and lands safely on the steamer. At that moment, last picture top row, inside the cabin, the captain of the steamer is saying, Now leave and port ahead of schedules against company rules, Mr. Meeker. Meeker replies, Well, it's our duty to protect the boat line's property from Indian raids, Captain. I'll take full responsibility. At that moment, the cabin door opens. First picture next row, and Hoppy says, You'll take full responsibility for a lot of things, Meeker. Without a word, Meeker ducks out another door and disappears on deck. Hoppy dashes after him. As he comes through the door, Meeker hurls a bucket at Hoppy's head, and Hoppy falls to the deck unconscious. Quickly, Meeker drags Hoppy's body down the gangway to the cargo compartment, first picture bottom row, and there locks him in, leaving him unconscious on the floor. A moment later, second picture bottom row, Meeker enters the cabin and says to the captain, Now set your course for Sabretooth Rapids. The captain replies, Why, you're mad, Meeker. The rocks and Russian current will smash us to bits. Last picture, Meeker draws a gun, saying, By that time, you won't be alive to see it, Captain. And I'll be free. Oh, that's terrible. If Hoppy's locked in that room on the boat, and the boat is smashed to bits on the rocks, then Hoppy will drown. Yes, Hoppy's in a tight situation this time. I wish the captain of the steamer would push Meeker into the river so that nothing would happen to Hoppy. Well, maybe next week we'll find out something like that will happen and that Hoppy will be rescued. Now? Now let's turn over the page and see if Prince Diane is there. Very well. Over the page we go. And here he is. And I'm anxious to read this because there's going to be a battle. Yes, the Danes have come to attack the land of Thule, which is Val's homeland. And last week, you remember, the Danes had begun to burn some of the towns, and I'm anxious to find out what happens next. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Brackett, Grey Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> King Aguar, Val's father, hurries to maneuver his ships to meet the Danes. As the two fleets move slowly toward each other, last picture top row, Aguar has his ships draw close and chains them together so the Danish ships cannot get between them. In this way, the warriors of Thule can pass across their own decks from ship to ship to defend any danger spot. And then, last picture, second row, the two lines of ships crash together and the battle begins. 
Once again, Bell's glittering, singing sword flashes in the thick of battle. <laughs> then, first picture, bottom row, the Danes set one of Bell's ships afire. <laughs> King Agui orders the ship to be cut loose to keep the flames from spreading to the other ships near it. Cut that ship down! The burning ship floats off by itself, leaving an opening between the ships chained together. And before the opening can be closed, the Danish boats slip through to attack from the rear. Last picture, King Aguar sees the Danes breaking through and exclaims, I would that Bolter were here. Oh, isn't that terrible? They had to take off the chains and just the thing that they tried to stop has happened. Yes, the wall of ships has been broken and the Danes have separated some of Val's ships from the others. This is the time for Bolter to appear if he ever will. Yes, because he's such a strong, fighting man. Do you think he'll come in well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now, let's turn over the page. Oh, look. Here's Donald Duck underneath the little king. Well, I don't I, I don't think you want to read that, do you? Well, I do, too. You know, I just love Donald. Oh, very well, then. Excuse me. We'll read Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeege him, squeege him, squeeze chicka chat. Let's, let's have, have music to be a quack, quack. <laughs> Donald's nephews, Louie, Huey, and Dewey, have been reading a book on science. Huey says to Donald, second picture, top row, Hey, Uncle Donald, it says here, Ben Franklin discovered lightning was electricity by using a kite and a key. Donald replies, That's right, boy. He did. Dewey answers, Oh, we don't believe it. Donald looks out the window and says, Well, fortunately, boy, we're about to have a storm. Run, get a kite and your key. Last picture, top row. Donald and his nephews come out of the house carrying a kite and a key. Huey slams the door behind him. Donald says, Now, I'll show you how Ben did it. Now, notice, I'm wearing rubber gloves. He ties the key to the end of the string and throws the kite into the air. Up, up it goes until it is way up in the sky. Donald says, Now, watch. Uh, Master said, the boys see lightning traveling down the string into the key, dangling at the end of it. And they see the key melt under the lightning's heat. Donald exclaims, Wow, what a bolt. Melted the key. Suddenly it begins to rain. They all run for the house. They try the door. Uh-oh. Locked. At last picture, there they stand, locked out of the pouring rain because the lightning ruined their key. Dewey says, Why didn't you tell us it would melt? And Louie wails, we wouldn't have used the front door key. And Donald goes, Ah, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good joke on Donald. <laughs> Why? Do you think it's funny to be locked out in the rain? <laughs> oh, I don't mind. I love the rain. Donald looks so funny sitting there with his face in his hands. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> well, anyway, he showed his nephews how Benjamin Franklin learned about electricity. Yes, he did. But I don't think that Benjamin Franklin's key melted. I'm glad, because I saw a picture of Benjamin Franklin once, and he was wearing a very expensive suit. It was much too good to be lost out in the rain. Yes, and what's more, Benjamin Franklin was a very famous man. And I don't think that famous men should get caught in the rain. You're a very nice girl. Now? Now, could we please read Uncle Remus? He's so cute. Well, I think we can. Go across the page, past Perry Mason and the Lone Ranger... Turn over another page. And look, there across the page is Uncle Remus. Yes, and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit, habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, Mammy Bammy, the rabbit witch, is always willing to help Br'er Rabbit when it's for some good. Br'er Rabbit has a scheme. He's visiting Mammy Bammy, the rabbit witch, and she's saying to Br'er Rabbit, And whoever takes this honesty pew will do nothing but honest things for 11 hours. She hands him a pill. Br'er Rabbit says, well, 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 I was thinking about myself, but I know somebody who needs it worse than I do. A little later, Br'er Rabbit is peeking through the window of Br'er Fox's home. Br'er Fox is surrounded by things he has stolen from all the critters in the community. And Br'er Fox says gleefully, 
The way I bamboozles them critters out of their belongings. Yes, <laughs> Br'er Rabbit reaches through the window and drops the pill into a glass of sassafras juice that Br'er Fox has in his hand. Br'er Fox gobbles the drink. Ah, that tastes good. Brr, I suddenly feel the difference. <laughs> That night, last picture top row, Br'er Rabbit sees Br'er Fox going down the road with a load of stolen stuff. And he hears Br'er Fox say, I was ashamed of myself for swiping things. Now I was going to give it all back. Br'er Rabbit hears this and exclaims, Uh-oh, the honesty pill is working. An hour later, first picture bottom row, Br'er Fox has made his last delivery. He's left a bathtub at Br'er Coon's house. And Br'er Rabbit hears him say, Ah. Oh. At last, I is an honest critter, and my conscience is as clean as a soap bubble. Seven hours later, the critters in the community are showing each other the things that have been returned to them. Br'er Coon points to his bathtub, saying, Yeah, it just showed up, out of nowhere. And Br'er Pokefine says, It's a miracle. And old Granddad Rabbit shakes his head and says, Yeah, something's mighty strange. <laughs> Eleven hours later, Burr Rabbit peeks through Burr Fox's window. He sees a strange look come over Burr Fox's face, and he hears Burr Fox say, Uh, I feel funny. The honesty pill has worn off. And then Burr Fox looks around his room and exclaims, Hey, what's happened? Why is everything? He sees all the stuff he has stolen is gone, and he leaps to his feet, clenches his fist, and he howls, Oh, oh he's been robbed! <laughs> and Uncle Remus says, Sometimes honesty gets loose from the worst kind of folks. <laughs> oh, that was a good joke yeah. on Burr Fox. When he took the honesty pills, he gave back all the things he stole. And then when the medicine wore off and he sees everything is gone, he thinks he's been robbed. <laughs> Yes, it is. I hope he never finds out Br'er Rabbit did this to him. Oh, if he does, that'll be terrible. Well, maybe we'll see that next week. Now... Oh, now, let's go over the page and see who's there. You sometimes it sticks adventures. And this is one of those sometimes. For here on the last page of the first section is Dick and his adventures. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Dick's Adventures. Magic words for the music, please. Say them with me, please. riggedy pack a zack a zick That's our music for adventurous Dick. It's the year 1804, the early days of America. And Dick, with Captains Lewis and Clark, is on his way up the Missouri River in a huge flatboat on a mission to explore the Northwest Territory. The longer the trip continues, the more wild the land becomes. They are met by Indians who have warned them not to go on because many dangers lie ahead. Dick, who has watched their faces as they talk, draws Captain Lewis and Clark aside, last picture top row, and says, They want us here because they'd like to get hold of our supplies and rifles. I don't trust them for a minute. Captains Lewis and Clark walk back to the Indians and first picture next row listen as Chief Black Bull speaks. Friend Hawken, oh my white brothers, the sun grows colder and soon the river will fill with ice. Make your camp here among us. Captains Lewis and Clark decide to accept the Indians' offer. They pay no attention to Dick's warnings and the sly, smiling band of red men depart for their village. Next morning, last picture, second row, Dick and Captain Lewis, out in the woods hunting for game, come on the village of their Indian friends. They approach cautiously and find that the village is deserted, not an Indian's in sight. Then, second picture, bottom row, in one of the lodges, they find a man tied to a post. Quickly, they release the unfortunate captive, who says... Beware of their friendship. I am French-Canadian. They have kept me prisoner for ten years. Then he leads them to the sound of noise deep into the woods, brings them to the edge of a clearing, last picture. They peer through the leaves and see the Indians in a hot frenzy of a war dance. 
and the captive says, Voila, mes amis, you see, they are preparing to welcome you as they welcome me. There, you see, Dick was right. Yes, he was right. Well, now maybe Captain Lewis and Clark will listen to him and hurry and get away. Yes, maybe they will, if they get back to their boat safely. Oh, I never thought of that. You think they will? Well, that's something you'll find out next week. Oh, I certainly won't miss that. I just have to know whether Dick gets away safely. So do I. Now look, underneath Dick's adventures, here's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And something's happening here that I'm worried about. Because there are two thieves who've come to Milestone Farm. Yes, but Mr. Miles doesn't know they're thieves because one of them, Sir Percival, an Englishman, looks very respectable. He seems to be a very nice fellow. Yes, and you remember last week, some expensive things were brought to the farm from the bank, and Sir Percival is planning to steal them. Well, let's read right now and see whether he does or not. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Sir Percival and his crony, the man named Nobby, who is pretending to be Sir Percival's chauffeur, are standing under the window of the room where Mr. Miles has been talking to the bank guard. As Rusty and Pete approach the house, they see Sir Percival and his chauffeur looking at the car. Pete asks, Hey, what's the matter? Something wrong with your car? Sir Percival replies, Oh, yes, yes. Perhaps you can help, boys. Ask Tex if he'll let you have a pinch bar and a cold chisel. Rusty replies, Oh, sure, Mr. Percival. Come on, Pete. <laughs> Two minutes later, first picture, bottom row, Rusty and Pete are back with the tools. Here are the tools you asked for, Sir Percival. Pete and I are going to see if Mr. Miles will show us the horse show trophies. Oh, yes, thank you, my boy. Uh, just put them down under the window here. A moment later, Rusty and Pete come into the study just as the guard goes out the door. Rusty asks, oh, Excuse me, Mr. Miles, can we see the trophies before you put them away? Mr. Miles smiles. Why, certainly, boys. There they are. The big one's very famous. It's worth over $5,000. Well, I'll have to put them in the safe now, as I am taking Sir Percival to the country club for dinner. Last picture. Outside, under the window, Nobby looks at the tools lying under the window and says, Hey, what was the big idea of sending those kids for these tools first? What are you going to do with them? He bends down to pick them up. Sir Percival stops him. Now, hold it, hold it, Nobby. Don't touch them. A pinch bar and a cold chisel with a nice set of Rusty's fingerprints on them, lying under that window, will be very useful to us. Oh, so that's his scheme. Why, that mean old thing. He's going to steal those trophies and then make it look like Rusty Yes, that's a rotten thing to do, isn't it? Make it look as though two little boys are to blame for something that they didn't do. Oh, I, I hope Tex finds out what they're up to and, and just fixes Sir Percival up good. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now? Oh, oh, here's Dagwood and Blondie on the first page of the second section. So let's go with the first page of the second section and Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie, with a cheerful smile and that certain look in her eyes, says to Dagwood... Dagwood, I saw the cutest new hat today. Dagwood screeches... No, you can't have it! Whereupon Blondie breaks into tears. Oh, and crying won't make me change my mind. Somebody has to be firm around here. Blondie goes out of the room. Dagwood clenches his fist, clenches his teeth, clenches his brows, and says, last picture top row... It's a husband's duty to put his foot down at a proper time. And thank goodness I'm strong will enough to mean no when I say no. <laughs> First picture, second row. He hears Cookie saying to Blondie, oh, Don't cry, Mama. You give in. And he hears Alexander, Oh, Daddy doesn't stay cross long. Dagwood gives a snort. Oh, they think I'll give in. Oh, well, I'll show them I'm a man of steel with an inflexible character. That moment the doorbell rings. Dagwood opens the door, last picture, second row. His neighbor, Herb Woodley, hands him a $10 bill, saying, Oh, Dagwood, we're expecting a COD package for $10, but we have to go out. Uh, will you take it for us? Uh, here's a 10 Okay, Herb, I'll do it for you. First picture, next row, Dagwood says, I'll put the $10 right here on the table for the delivery man. 
Cookie and Alexander see Dagwood put the $10 on the table and leave the room. They rush in, pick up the $10, rush into the next room, and Cookie yells, Pop gave in! Yeah, he put $10 on the hall table for you to buy your hat, Mom. Blondie exclaims. Really? And she grabs the $10. And a few seconds later, a cloud of dust whooshes down the street. It's Blondie after her new hat. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, Alexander and Cookie come into Dagwood's room. And Cookie says, Well, look, Daddy, Mama wrote this note for you before she went down to get her new hat. Hat! And he reads the note. Darling Dagwood, you're the sweetest, most generous, kindest husband in the world. I knew you'd relent, and I love you more than ever, Blondie. Tears trickle down Dagwood's cheeks. And he says, Isn't she sweet? Moment later, Alexander sticks his head in the door and says, last picture, Hey, there's a man at the door who wants ten dollars for a package, Pop. Dagwood takes ten dollars out of his pocket and sighs. Oh, well, I guess husbands can't have a will of iron. <laughs> Oh, that was a good joke on Dad. Yeah. <laughs> he was going to be so tough and not give Blondie any money. <laughs> yes, and he gets stuck anyway. Yes, but the nice part of it is he was so nice about it in the end. Yes, he was. Oh, look, underneath Tagwood and Blondie, there's Roy Rogers. And remember, Roy is after the cattle rustlers. Yes, and he and his friend Dolfo Hawkins got lost in the train car. Yes, the caboose. And then the rustlers pushed the car down the tracks, which lead down a hill. Sure that it would crash and kill Roy and Dolph. My, I hope that won't happen. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip I o Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip I o The caboose rolls down the incline, going faster and faster. The rustler, dude, says to his pal, Well, we'll take it easy, Rocky. I don't know what the big boss looks like, but he sent word he'd pay us off here for the last job. (laughs) Meanwhile, inside the caboose, Roy tries his best to break out. He exclaims, Hey, these windows are barred, Dolfo. We gotta find another way out of this runaway caboose. Faster and faster the caboose goes. It whips down an incline on the edge of a high cliff. Last picture, top row. Hey, we gotta try smashing the door before we jump the tracks. They grab some blocks of wood and hammer away at the door. And then finally the door breaks open. And none too soon. For first picture, bottom row, they see a sharp curve ahead. Jump, go full! <laughs> at that moment... A man on horseback comes around the bend and sees the caboose rolling down the cliff. He says, Well, an interesting sight. I hope you, Dawson, and Rocky are not inside that car. I don't want them dead before I have a chance to meet them. When the caboose has crashed to a stop at the bottom of the cliff, he continues up the trail. At last picture, he sees Dolfo stuck between two rocks where he had landed when he jumped. And he finds Roy trying to pull him loose. The man says, Greetings, gentlemen. I believe I can assist at extricating your friends, sir. Step aside. Oh, I'm so glad Roy got out of that caboose in time. He would have been killed for sure. Yes, he would have been. I wonder who that stranger is. Well, that's something we'll find out next week, I hope. Yes, and I hope next week we'll see Roy catch up with that dude, and I'll bet you he'll be sorry. Yes, I'll bet you he will be, too. But now, let's go over the page and see what we shall see. Oh, there's Flush Gordon. And you remember, he's been captured by Queen Menta, that cruel queen of the Martians. Yes, and remember last week, she was going to test a new weapon on Link. Flash's friend. And just as the man was going to press the button to do it, Flash jumped at him and turned the machine on the guards and on the queen. Yes, he saved Link's life. Now let's see if Flash captures the queen. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. The 
Guards run for their lives as Flash swings the deathly machine toward them. Link and Dale capture the queen. Suddenly, she stops struggling and tells them she's received a thought message. Tornadoes are sweeping an avalanche of desert sand toward the city. Last picture top row, Flash dashes to the observation platform. He sees Meta's alarm is no trick. The tornado is already engulfing the city's outskirts. Flash shouts, Come on, Meta, there's no time to lose. Manta is about to order an evacuation of the city. First picture, bottom row. But Flash stops her. Hey, wait, Manta, wait. Your city can be saved if we can smash the hurricane center with thermic blast. Last picture, Flash, using the Martians' fantastic new weapons, hurls repeated volleys of atom beams and thermic bombs into the face of the onrushing tornado of sand. The vast power of even these super weapons seems puny when pitted against the titanic natural forces of a strange planet gone berserk. Ooh, isn't that a terrible storm? It looks like it could just blow the whole world away. Yes, Flash is up against a powerful enemy this time. Do you think that machine can ever save them? Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. It's a powerful machine. Now you'll be here? Oh, I certainly will. I certainly will. So will I. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Now, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Big Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.